Hi there. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Not even lunch could take you away. I do appreciate that. Uh, this talk is normally half hour long. I'm going to compress it into 15 minutes. Wish me luck. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about data-driven post-mortems. That's me. That's my terrible Twitter handle. And that's the name of the company I work for. A little bit about me for context. I'm a long-time system administrator, really into DevOps. I like to eat, and I like to tell dad jokes. Excuse me. A little bit about the company I work for. It's called Datadog. Datadog. It's a SaaS-based monitoring company. We do all the things, metrics, alerting, APM. We're doing demos out there. Please do take a look. Trillions of data points per day. It's a pretty cool company to work for, and we are hiring. So if that sounds interesting to you, hit me up. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about today is data-driven postmortems. I'd like to open this talk up with a quote. Henry Ford, deeply flawed man, had this to say, the only real mistake is the one from which we learn nothing. And that is really the thesis statement here. Mistakes are OK to make as long as you learn from them. And a data-driven postmortem is a great way to learn from those mistakes. It's not all doom and gloom. We can have a little bit of fun. And it's important to have a little bit of fun. It's important to have a little levity, especially when you're thinking about your failures and the mistakes that you've made. It's easy to get down, all right? Just keep in mind, it's OK to laugh. Uh, on a status page, for example, is a good way <laughs> to laugh at tech world mistakes. So how do you know when something broke? And critically, how do you know how to prevent it from breaking in the future? Well, first things first, instrument everything. It should come as no surprise. I work for a monitoring analytics company, and the big thing we like to do is monitor things. Collect data. Okay? Collecting data is cheap. We'll put cheap in quotes. Specifically, it's cheap compared to how much it's going to cost you if you don't have it when you need it. Uh, there's a really cool quote here fellow by the name of Ian Malpass on the Code is Craft blog. This was Etsy's engineering blog from some years ago. He said, if it moves, we track it. Sometimes we'll draw a graph of something that isn't moving yet, just in case it decides to make a run for it. And that should really be your overriding philosophy here. Graph and track and monitor everything, like 10 terabytes of S3 storage with one put a second, which is a lot of data and pretty good granularity, is going to cost you something like 320 US dollars a month. It's not a big deal. Graph everything. So you think about how much it's going to cost you when you have an outage and you don't know why, suddenly that was money well spent. But now that I've convinced you, you should graph everything and you should track everything, what should you be tracking, right? What are those metrics? At that dog, we like to talk about the big three. And I know I'm going quick, but that's the name of the game. We talk about work metrics, resource metrics, and events. These are the three different ways that we talk about metrics that you should be tracking. First one is work metrics. What are work metrics? They include the top level health of your system, right? We're measuring useful output here. In this particular case, a good way to think about it is donuts. Donuts get made on a conveyor belt, right? So the subtypes of work metrics could be throughput, requests per second, or the number of donuts being produced over a period of time. Success, the percentage of 200 responses, for example, or the number of donuts which are delicious. Error, percentage of 500 responses, or the number of donuts which are not delicious. And finally, the performance, right? What's your 90th percentile on successful donut production? With me so far? Super. We have another type of metric that we like to track, and that's resource metrics. Uh, they're especially valuable for investigation and diagnoses during and after the fact. There's utilization. That's the percentage of time something's busy or in use, right? How much uh, sugar is coming out of these packets? Saturation, queued work, backlog. How many donuts do we have to make still? Errors. How many donuts burst into flames or fell on the ground, right? And availability. That's the amount of time that a service can be used, whether it's being used or not. These are all critical ways to think about your infrastructure, and these are the critical data points you should be collecting from your infrastructure. Finally, we also talk about events. Now, these are discrete Infrequent occurrences, and that's an important definition there, discrete infrequent occurrences that can provide crucial context for understanding what's changed in your system's behavior. Now, this could be pretty much anything as long as it fits that criteria of discrete and infrequent. Code changes, alerts, scaling events. Someone visiting your web page, it's discrete, but it happens all the time, not an event, right? Even if you're doing a lot of high-speed continuous deployment, your code changes, maybe you're doing like 10 deploys a day, those are events because it fits the criteria. I didn't know what graphic to put here, so I put one of Homer Simpson eating donuts to follow the donut theme. <laughs> Once you're tracking these data points and you're using the framework of work, resources, and events, 
you can start to use an interesting tool, which we like to call recursion, <laughs> as discovery. This is a bit like falling down the rabbit hole. If anybody here has been uh, in other talks about postmortems or about discovery processes, you may have heard something called the five whys. This is a metrics-driven way to think about the five whys. All right? How much work was happening? Why did it stop happening? Well, because we ran out of resources on the thing. Oh, well, why did we run out of resources on the thing? Well, because this event happened. Well, why did the event happen? Well, it's because we pushed some new code. Code for what? Well, we wanted to have a new feature. What's the feature for? And so on and so forth. This is a way to drill down into the source of the actual problems. And you get it for free when you're tracking these statistics and you're modeling and thinking about these data points in this way. Works really, really nicely. All right, a problem happened. Disaster has struck. When do you need to start thinking about these metrics in this way? When do you need to start diving into the problem? The reality is timing is everything, all right? If you're still actively responding to the incident, it's not time to do a postmortem. Kind of goes without saying. Concentrate on remediation. That's your most important thing. If something is broken, it's got to be fixed, or at least you got to get it to a point where it's not completely broken again. And concentrate on data collection. Now, there's a little bit of difference there. Collecting data and analyzing data. Not the same thing. Collect everything, analyze it later. Your primary goal needs to be restoring service. For example, in case of a car crash, and you can see I took my donut theme in the background, uh, the police officer is not going to show up and go, well, was this a problem with the drivetrain? No. They're going to fix, uh, you know, fix themselves on, are people hurt? Do we have to get wreckage out of the way? Right? Maybe there's going to be an investigator who's going to come through. They're going to take photographs, pictures, like this gentleman over here. They're going to take some notes. They're going to talk to some people. Collect the data. Don't worry about analyzing it. Speaking of talking to some people, who do you want to talk to? Well, you want to talk to the humans. It's great to collect the data, and that's happening automatically if you're using something like Datadog or one of our many uh, competitors in the space. But the simple fact of the matter is that technical issues often have non-technical components, or put otherwise, humans use computers. We don't, we're not part of the singularity yet. The computers aren't using the computers. We're still involved, thankfully, or perhaps not. So when you think about the data collection, think not only about collecting the data from the computers, those automated collection processes, but from the people involved as well. So who do you collect the data from? Well, the short answer is everybody. The short answer is wrong. You can't collect it from everybody. Not everybody is relevant. It takes you too much time anyway. Think of it in terms of being a detective. You have first responders, right? Those would be like the police. You want to talk to them. You want to talk to the identifiers. That's the term we use. Those are like the witnesses, okay? And you want to talk to the affected users or you know, the victims of the car crash, right? So hopefully this is not a life and death scenario in your <laughs> environment, but these are the people you want to speak to, right? So who are the actual responders? Who are the people around that? And who are the people that are affected by it? In this case, that might mean talking to your customers, might mean talking to non-technical people in your environment. That's fine. A good detective is never going to investigate a collision by only speaking with the one person down the street who saw it, right? You have to take an holistic approach. What are you collecting from the humans, right? So we're talking about human data collection here. You want to talk up to them about their perspectives, thoughts, impressions, recollections, what they did, why they did it, what they thought, why they thought it, all right? You need to uncover false indicators. You need to do it quickly. Oftentimes, if a person is responsible, we talk about human error, and uh, John Alspaugh, the former CTO at Etsy, uh, has a great quote, which is that human error doesn't exist. Turns out... It's true, and I invite you to read one of the books he's written on the topic. But you do need to talk to people to figure out what went wrong. Uh, pro tip, don't ask binary questions. There's no yes or no here, all right? You want to ask open-ended questions that are going to get people thinking about what happened, why it happened, their thought processes, their feelings. That's when you start to get into the meat of that human data collection. We're humans. We're designed to produce and ingest narrative, all right? Data points are good, looking at a graph is good, but we are historically and evolutionary storytellers. Writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. This is super important. Write everything down. As you're doing the human data collection, quote unquote, and you're writing things down, ask the people who are involved to write things down as well, all right? The process of getting your thoughts onto paper helps to crystallize those thoughts. Enrich the story and the timeline with snapshots and graphs from your monitoring tool. We live in a glorious age of computing. Multimedia is a real thing. Words are great. Throw some pictures in there, too. 
literally go through this process of writing stuff down. It's super, super helpful. As an aside, in the Datadog product, we believe in this so much that we have a notebook built into the product so that people can, don't have to context switch between looking and solving a problem and writing down what, the, what they think the problem is. So when do you collect the data? Short answer again here, <laughs> as soon as possible. All right. Memory drops sharply within about 20 minutes, and then it's going to convert in your brain to you know, effectively long-term or cold storage. Uh, susceptibility to false memory increases over time. All right. There's something called the uh, Ebbinghaus curve, which is identified in the late 1800s, that actually suggested uh, that uh, memory drops off exponentially after about two days or so. All right. So you have a two-day window, which is the maximum amount of time that you should leave when you're in your investigation period. Ideally, you're doing it in 20 minutes. Never let it go longer than two days. Maybe people are going on vacation. Doesn't matter. Phone them up. All right. If it's bad enough, we'll figure it away. What happens to the data? Well, just like data on a hard drive that maybe got hit by radiation or something like that, humans have data skew and corruption as well. And that can be due to a lot of things. Stress, right? Sleep deprivation, especially if you pull it all-nighter trying to fix the freaking problem. Burnout. Burnout's real. We all work in tech. Okay? These are real-world issues. And you, as the data collector, need to be sensitive to these issues. You may yourself be suffering from these issues. And that's important to realize when you're in that data collection period. Now is not the time to be aggressive. Now is the time to be empathetic. Super, super important. Fear. Some say fear is a great motivator. Well, fear is a great destroyer of thought processes. Fear is a great destroyer of memories. Especially if you're working in a high-stakes environment and you screwed up, you're worried about getting fired. <laughs> Happens, all right? You, as the data collector, need to be aware of this, all right? Sensitivity, empathy, sympathy, these are key tools in the human data collection process. Uh, there's a whole slide here about bias, which I do not have time to get into, but if you are not familiar with the many different types of biases that humans are subject to, I suggest you take a little bit of time out next week to buy some books on from your favorite retailer, head down to the library, learn about biases. Super, super important if you're part of the data collection and remediation team. So how do we do postmortems at Datadog? We actually try to live this. The spoiler alert here is we don't do it perfectly, because perfect doesn't exist. You aim at what you want, and you try your best. So we're continually iterating over this process. We're continually trying to get better at it using the principles that I've just explained to you. Now, some quick notes on that. Postmortems are emailed to the entire organization. We do not hide our failures internally. All right? It's scary, but the thing is, is stuff fails all the time. And when stuff fails all the time and postmortems happen all the time, the fear of being named in a postmortem disappears because it's routine. In fact, we like this so much that we schedule recurring all hands meetings every two weeks where anybody can get together and talk through the most recent postmortem. Even people, and especially people, who weren't involved in the problem. This allows everybody to learn and to grow and to stop fearing failure. It's an amazing tool and it works. Just give it time. So, in summary, what happened? All right, describe what happened at a high level. Think of it as an abstract in a scientific paper, okay? What was the impact on the customers? Always laser focus on that. What was the severity of the outage? What components were affected? And what ultimately resolved the issue? These are the key items that you want to see in a postmortem. Literally these things. If it's not these things, it doesn't belong in a postmortem. Now, these things can be pretty wordy. They can contain a lot of information. That's fine. But these are the topics. What happened? Describe what happened at a high level. It's an abstract and scientific paper again. What was the impact on the customer? Super, super critical. And what resolved the issue? How are you going to stop it from happening again in the future? Now, as I said, this is normally about a 30-minute talk or 25 of Q&A. I'm compressing it down into 15 minutes. That 15 minutes is basically now. So there are more slides. How was it detected, right? We include some graphs. How did we respond? Who was the incident owner? What did they do? What needs improvement? What went well? Remember, it's not all negative. If you had some wins in the process, call those out. That's very, very important. If you have chat rooms, include real-time archives. And finally, this is key, track your learnings and talk about them in those post-mortem all hands and reviews, all right? Generate that discussion. Talk about those things. Don't be afraid to dive right in. That's super, super critical. Uh, tut, 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 tut. Here are some more resources. 
If you want to take a picture of that, definitely check these URLs out. There are some big, big names who've had a lot of things to say on this, and you'll see the same names coming up time and time again. John Ospaugh, uh, J. Paul Reed, who has a really funny blog post about blameless, podums, bl blameless postmortems don't work. I'll give you some more resources here if you'd like to take a picture. And I have the screen beside me telling me my time is up. So I'll give you just a quick second to see this. Dave Zwiebeck, by the way, is uh, an absolute gentleman. Reach out to him on Twitter. He makes time for everyone. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>